Hello to everybody. My name is Andrus. I come from Estonia, very far north. It's uh, close to Finland, if you know, and also close to other Baltic states like Latvia and Lithuania, and also to our big neighbor, Russia. But before I start, I would like that some of you from the back uh, seats would come closer. Then I will see if you sleep in. Jerry and Charlotte, you especially. <laughs> Estonia is a, a national country which has a population of 1.4 million people, so it's quite small. One third of the population is Russian speaking, so we are quite well on target of uh, today's uh, uh, Russian regime. But that's not the topic what I wanted to talk about. I myself is, uh, I am from a very little village called Viratsi, which has just uh, 2,000 inhabitants. I have studied in Tallinn, Estonia and in uh, uh, Luzern, Switzerland. And with my partner Raivo, I started the company Coco just 15 years ago. So not quite a long time ago. And um, I will talk to you about, I believe, four projects today. The transformations in uh, contemporary architecture and what is needed to make such things. The first picture, what I show you, is not from Estonia. It's not from Paris. The picture is from Jerusalem. And the picture is made in the 19th century, around, nine, around 1885. So it's quite young uh, photography uh, after the daguerreotype. And what we see on the picture is uh, the Church of Holy Sepulchre. It's the most holy church for all uh, Christian people, as that's the place where uh, Jesus uh, went into the heaven. But one thing is uh, special by this church. It has a special thing or detail. And the detail is in the middle of the picture, and it's called immovable leather. The story goes back around two, three hundred years. Nobody knows. And the story is connected to Christianity. That all six orders of Christianity have to agree by this church, by any change. And when this agreement was made, on that moment, some reparation work on the window was going on, and the ladder was there. And when they agreed that nothing will be changed, was that also about this ladder. And the next picture, she was the same letter just last year when I visited Jerusalem. I tell you this story because when you go and touch a heritage, then everybody has to agree. And when they don't, then a detail of a house cannot be changed. And that's, I believe, one of the most uh, basic things to get the understanding on the core or the core of, uh, of your idea to make it work so that also everybody else will believe you. That's one more picture. You see, it's really Jerusalem, Holy Sepulchre. And my first story goes to the Fale House in Tallinn, which is an old cellulose factory. It was the building what we transformed was just one part of the factory. It was uh, the boiler house. So the factory itself was huge on that time. And uh, it had developed throughout uh, three centuries, as the placement was very perfect for uh, making of a paper factory. It was between a lake and the sea at the riverside, so that from the small paper mill a factory grew and grew until it was so big that it could uh, produce one-third of the Tsar Russia paper needs. But throughout the times, the factory wasn't very popular in the city. 
and in the beginning of the 20th century, the nearby military, the military uh, camp had a complaint and uh, they went to the court and told the factory is not good in the city, you should move it and quickly because the smell of the sulfur from the factory is coming into our lungs and it's disturbing our everyday life, our thoughts, our military actions. And please, there are ministers at the court, please change it. What happened was the opposite. The factory had so good lawyers that uh, the decision was that the soldiers have to go every Thursday to the factory, to the boiler house, and to inhale the smell of the sulfur because it's good for the lung diseases. It was so in the beginning of 20th century and it stayed throughout the 20th century until the last decade. Here is a picture from um, 1970s. The piles of wood go until the horizon. The wood was imported from uh, nearby countries by trains And also the factory used one third of the water for the city Tallinn and, as you see, made a lot of smoke. When the Second World War was over and Estonia was occupied by Soviet uh, forces and regime, the time wasn't the best where it was. Overall in Europe it was uh, just uh, quite bad. Here you see a picture from the 1950s, a wedding in the factory. People were so poor that they couldn't afford a proper dress for the bride. And you see, the dress is made out of paper. When Soviet Union got 50 years old, you see the factory building there, 1972. Already, uh, windows broken. You can see just empty holes instead of windows. When I asked one of the former workers, why is it so? He said, what's the problem? The boiler house was so hot that uh, when the temperature was not below minus 20, then it was okay inside. And when it was uh, lower than minus 20, then they used their uh, jackets to fill up all the holes. And that was also okay. There is a picture of the model of the, of the factory. It's huge. It's the incoming main road to the Tallinn city. And the boiler house was just one part of it. My first connection to the factory was in 1995. I was the student in 1995. And my connection was that the factory was in bankruptcy and I went to this empty space. I was, I thought so. I was a contemporary artist. I made exhibitions, installations, performances. And so I went to an empty factory, made pictures. I was fascinated by these views. And I made exhibition. It was called Purgatory, the place between the heaven and the hell. When you are not bad enough to go to hell, you go to Purgatory. And I made a story as a conceptual artist that every picture is a story or place in the purgatory and I have met somebody who was there to make these photos. The exhibition was successful, it travelled around in Europe. And once I was invited to a small town, Narva, close to Russian border. And then I thought the population in Narva do not understand the contemporary art and my pictures are useless as the people live in the surrounding surroundings which are close to this picture. And I was inspired by some unknown artist, Victor, who was making uh, healing pictures. You know, these kind of pictures. You have a picture in frame, there is a triangle or a ring or quadrat and there is written text below. Look at this picture five minutes and your heart is getting better. So I did. I did exhibition of healing pictures for the people in Narva. 
I placed uh, the inside, the magnetic disc, from a floppy disk, you know, these old disks. And magnetic ring, it looks so uh, unfamiliar and unknown thing. I placed it uh, in front of the picture and uh, uh, wrote down energy of uh, healing energy on, uh, on the world's level. Uh, look at the picture five minutes and you, you will get uh, better health. That was my interpretation to bring usual people to modern art and to convince them to look at the pictures and to find maybe a beauty in that, in this structure, what you would say that is nonsense. It's, uh, it's worth of demolishing, not in a year, but let's say tomorrow. So thought also, in a way, um, uh, Estonian president, he was uh, very ashamed of the factory and the buildings because the ruins stayed on the road between the airport and city center. And every time he had, uh, let's say, foreign visitors on high level, he had to say them or tell them some anecdotes, funny stories, so that they don't look at the ugliness of uh, Tallinn, because the old city in Tallinn is very beautiful. That's the picture how it looked from the street side. And then the factory went into bankruptcy in 1994. Ten years, people had thought, what to do with these ruins? Can we demolish it? No, because it was made out of limestone and was under uh, heritage as industrial heritage symbol. So it was like uh, lost for everybody. The heritage couldn't start anything and the developers had no idea how to recover the building. And the government said, it's too expensive to recover, so we will give no social or, let's say, uh, public function to the building. On one morning in March 2004, I met per accident uh, with one developer. We had to just discuss the housing project, what he had close to Tallinn. Not very important. And throughout this meeting, we just dreamed about the house, about these ruins in the city center. And we made a deal in the cafe. He said, I will buy it, the ruins. And I had to do, he had to do just one thing. I had to do three things. I had to find 10 fools, 10 stupid people who would live in an old rotten factory. Second, I had to convince the heritage that it's doable. And third, his condition was that it has to be the project of the year. But he didn't say where. Should it be the quarter where the factory stays? Should it be Tallinn, Estonia, whatever? It wasn't clear. But one thing was clear and came out on this meeting, that to do a reconstruction of such a building you need something extra, which means you have to add some kind of value to get it to work for private money, because the reconstruction is absolutely much more expensive than the price for what you can sell this space. And uh, by doing this kind of reconstruction, you never know how high the cost will be, because you have so many unknown details by it. And the scheme shows basically everything. The original state, the picture number two shows uh, how we found it. It was used by homeless people here on the second level, drug addicts here, scrap from, from the silo here. And we came, let's say, to conclusion that the best place to add value is to make the building higher. It was meant to be a dead end. When I first went to the Tallinn Heritage Department and said we have such an idea for the factory, then um, the head of the heritage said to me, without hearing more, just out. You are a full idiot. You don't come with this uh, story again. I went back on the next Wednesday when he had uh, 
the time when he, let's say, talks to usual citizen. I could show a little bit of the project. He said, why do you, say, why do you tell me that, that story that you could place there something? Because it's under heritage and he said to me that when you don't know then the heritage is something what you have to keep in the size and shape what it is. And I asked him, can I go and tell my story to the National Board of the Heritage? And then the story was the different. The Heritage Board said, intelligent solution, do it. Because throughout uh, 10 years, people had thought, can they use the ruins for a casino, hotel, or even concert hall, or for Estonian Art Academy? And now we came out with a concept to make a multifunctional house, to place apartments on top of the old house, to make uh, offices somewhere in between, and to place restaurants and services on the ground level. We went through quite different shapes and designs for the house. Also a little bit tilted one like this. It was my favorite. Also a zeppelin, like a landed zeppelin on, on the roof of the house. And um, also one design which was inspired from our previous work. Uh, that's the picture from Hannover Expo 2000 where we made a Estonian pavilion with hanging fir trees on the roof. You know, fir trees on the roof moving a little bit like in the wind and waving to, to the visitors. And so we made a design that um, some trees are outside of the building. So we were in the search. We knew that we need something which is on top of the house, but we didn't know the concept, what should it be exactly. And we ended up with quite simple solution. It was effective financially, because it was meant to be a sponsor part of the house. And from the other side, we made a play with the glass facade. We used three different types of the glass, three different mirroring effects of the glass, so that the facade works on every weather differently. By um, cloudy sky, it looks greenish, and by um, clear sky, it looks uh, bluish. We were satisfied because we got uh, the idea that um, the old factory part looks very hard. It's hard because it's made out of uh, uh, limestone. And the upper part from glass is playing a game with the sky every day a little bit differently. On this picture you can see a little bit also from the construction, but not all. The limestone itself cannot hold additional weight. When you build so high house from limestone, then it has used all its, let's say, weight balance or ability to have more weight. So we couldn't add anything on top of the existing walls. We used some columns inside. We made new concrete shirts about or around the columns. And we went with these columns throughout the house to the top and placed the floors as consolic plates to these columns. So, first of all, we didn't add any columns to the original shape. We could keep the space inside as clear and clean as it was. And we could place the new floors. And constructively, as the floors are hanging from the columns, also the facade is hanging. So it just touches gently the old uh, limestone part. And the house is used so that the ground floor around the house is used for the services and shops, and there is a restaurant. The restaurant business is not, wasn't so good so that during economical turndown, he wanted to, the owner wanted to sell it to the carpenter shop, not the carpenter, carpet shop. And then, um, we, with my partner, collected all the, let's say, people from the house living there to make a promise to the restaurant that we will go there more often. Because I saw that the restaurant is the heart of the multifunctional house. If you don't have a place for eating, then it loses its energy to work throughout day and night. 
And here are some photos how it looks uh, in the city. So that um, it's a landmark visible from the sea. This photo is made from the ship. It's visible, um, yeah, let's say it's close-up view. And the other factory buildings are still in ruins, which means that uh, the Fale house has to pump energy into the area, and it does, so that the development of uh, other buildings would go on. And here are some uh, pictures. This is a picture from our office. Uh, on the upper side, you see a silo which was used for the chopped wood, which was uh, sent into the boiler. And instead of the original boiler, we have just meeting rooms made of glass and in the shame, same uh, shape and form as the boilers. Here are some uh, pictures from um, loft apartments built into the factory. And the story ended, uh, let's say, so that uh, the heritage was for it. It was chosen the house of the air in Estonia and also chosen to the final selection by um, Design Museum in London 2007 for the, let's say, exceptional designs of architecture. That was the first story. Next story goes to the, closer to the city centre in Tallinn, close to the old town, where we have a Rotterman's Quarter, which has been built as a harbour, close to harbour merchandise place and storage place more than 100 years ago. And the quarter was closed throughout all the Soviet era because there was a bread factory and, of course, all the factories should be closed, or it was closed area in this city. Everybody had to go around who wanted. And now, since ten, 10 years, the Rotmany Quarter has got uh, new energy. And um, around this middle square, new buildings, quite high, not quite high, let's say 24 meters is the height limit in, uh, in the quarter. All the buildings had got the height. And now we, we got the commission to work with the old carpenter's house. It's quite a difficult task. It was not a task what every architect would like to have. Because you have stupid low level, one or two floors high, old limestone house with some windows, with some openings, which do not make any sense or logic. And then somebody wants, can you do something so that the heritage is agreed and you get the height, or whatever you get, was the question by the developer. The question was so because the house wasn't master planned. And in this case, when you have a house under heritage, city or the heritage department do not, have any, do not have any other plans. But from the point of view of city planning, it was screaming for height. Because when you have a square which has three sides which are high and one side which is very low, then you feel how the energy of the square goes out. It doesn't have the walls. Like this hall here, when we take out this wall, then it's not the same hall. It's just view outside. You don't feel it's, it's a room or a place protected or defined. That's the situation. The carpenter's workshop is somewhere here, and it looked like this. It's really nothing what you would consider to renovate or transform. And so thought also uh, the developer. 
His uh, second idea was that we should help him to convince the heritage that it's not recoverable. But we didn't think so. We looked to the space and we thought about the industrial heritage. And by one travel to uh, Berlin, I visited an exhibition by German photographers. It's an old couple today, uh, Hilda and Bernd uh, Becher. They are known for their industrial portraits. As some of us make portraits of people, so did they portraits of industrial landscapes, by types of the buildings, by landscapes, by typologies, and they made it with German accuracy for decades. They have photographed all the landscapes in France, in Germany, in the States, in Canada, in Australia. And um, by looking to their exhibition, I was inspired by the fact, or by the, let's say, image that the industrial landscapes are aesthetical. They are just beautiful. And the beauty can be in very simple forms, which are generically engineered buildings without any help or any connection with architects. And the beauty stands in repetition in, of the form. If you look to these cooling towers, in a way it looks uh, architectural form. It's, uh, it's repetition of something which is basic, it's clear, and uh, most importantly it has a uh, necessary function. Or when you look to these buildings, when you look to these ones, let's say, it's, uh, when you wouldn't have this background, you could say that it's a composition of vases or ceramics in your interior. When you look to this picture, the upper one, then it looks like uh, creations from uh, some kind of uh, movie. And uh, everything here has a mathematic structure. By thinking about it, and not got any, let's say, usable idea, I traveled in the summer 2006 uh, to the eastern part of Estonia, where we have also factories from Soviet times, which are half functioning and half not. Uh, we climbed with one uh, mountain skier, uh, extreme sporter, over the fences, went to the area of the old uh, factory and found also the cooling towers, what I knew from the Becher's photographs, there on this industrial site. And by thinking about this connection, that from one side you need uh, space which is high. From the other side, you have industrial heritage which is below or is there. And it's very long in plans. We got to the idea that uh, we could use it somehow. And again, we didn't know how to do it exactly. We started, let's say, from uh, wrong end. We started first from uh, placing uh, metal formed uh, shapes on top of the old building, making in a way tank out of the limestone building. Secondly, we tried the shape of the cooling towers and uh, made it bubbly. So that it's, uh, the form is industrial, but the shape is uh, something what you, can, what you can see in your path. And next, we got more honest. We had also other limitations. One of the limitations is that uh, if you want to add something to the existing building, you cannot add more than one third of the existing space if you don't do the master planning in, uh, in the city. But to do it in one or by one building, it looked uh, nonsense because the master planning process is uh, very slow. So by thinking about it, was it again something for the idea of using the shape of the cooling towers? 
We placed them on top of the carpenter's factory or carpenter's house so that we kept a little distance from the roof of the old building to the start of the towers so that they are like hanging in air at top of the building so that uh, we don't destroy it. It doesn't look like uh, something is growing out uh, unexpectedly from the house. But when you look at it, you don't understand. Does it hang on top of it or is it behind it? You get irritated, especially. We went to the client and sold the idea. It wasn't difficult. He was excited. The story was different by heritage. It was similar to the Fale house, but uh, by showing by the sketch project the pictures by uh, Hilda and Bernd Becher made them soft. So we didn't do anything differently by two presentations of the project, but we told a little bit different story. We brought in the idea of the cooling towers, we explained it, and suddenly the heritage was behind it, us saying that, do it. But the next project, let's say the next problem with this kind of uh, project is uh, how to do it uh, in real world. As the old carpenter carpenter's house is standing just on the ground, the ground on this place is very soft. Soft because it was seabed just 500 years ago, so it's 20 meters of mud. And we know that during the last 20 years, the ground has moved 10 centimeters, which is very, let's say, difficult in case if you want to connect something to a house which is moving so actively and you want the new part to stand. We solved it so. We have in the middle like high columns. The column has inside lift and staircase. The column on ground is standing on piles and the concrete piles go into the earth as deep as the house is high. We used very small, the world's smallest piling machine so that the piling machine could fit into the interior because we wanted to keep old brick ceilings of the ground floor. So the piling machine was in here and laid piles 24 meters into the ground. So we have middle column which stands still and clearly on the rock which won't move within centuries, we are sure. We have the old house which can move 10 centimeters per two decades. And that was for us breakthrough. Everything else was quite simple. We had to find technical solution to make a, a dynamic and movable connection to the old and new part. Uh, as we had also already experience with, um, with consolic plates as floors from the Fale house, then it was easy to make small consoles here for these floors and to hang the facade onto it. For the client, the project wasn't easy because it was for them also a new experience. In a way, it's a Japanese concept because the space around the column is very small. It's 60 square meters on the lower floor and 45 on the upper floor. So that uh, you don't have usual office space. We made a brainstorm and found out, not when it was ready, but before, that uh, they invited people who could have offices there, or some law firms, their board can be there, some uh, advertising firms, some uh, people who have a big, bigger factory, but they have also separate ports, they could come there. With this idea, it was sold and it was very successful. Also, MTV uh, Baltic was moved in because from the house you have 360 degrees uh, view around the building. The space is small, 
you have the lift which opens into the into your uh, office space but it's uh, electronically guided no foreign let's say unexpected guests can come in and here you see that um, fire escape is also in the middle that was the 3d picture and that's the picture how it looks today so we didn't do fully 100% uh, glass facade. The house has uh, windows on the edges. They are triangular. And uh, for the next door cinema guests, they look like uh, alien eyes, so that when they come out from the cinema, then they have the feeling in the evening that the uh, alien ship has landed. And also uh, the windows, or let's say the spaces are lighted with uh, red light in the evening not because of the special function of the area but because the house is visible from the two axes on the main roads and uh, is in a way targeting or or showing for the people uh, the way to the Rotterman Square the ground floor of the house is restaurant it's used beautifully also with the uh, outside uh, part of the restaurant in the summer. First floor is um, some hairdresser and the upper floors are for the offices. And um, at the same time, the square is car free so that uh, below these uh, granite stones are two floors of parking. and some night views. As you can see, some uh, next door buildings are not repaired. But it's uh, usual, when the area is quite big, then uh, on this left part, the master planning has lasted 10 years and probably will take uh, at least five more. But uh, with no too big rush, you can say that um, uh, the city is not getting exceptionally bad architecture, at least uh, master planning for general, general purposes is, uh, is giving some quality. What is different in uh, Tallinn, to, let's say, to the, our neighboring city Helsinki, is that uh, the city Helsinki has in city department 400 architects who are doing the job of city planning. They do it on a daily basis. They do on it on the quarters, on the plots. It's all regulated by the will of the city. We have it in Tallinn a little bit differently. By law, it's the, it should be done by the city, but it's given to the developers and uh, it does give a little bit uneven results. In a way, when you look to this building, then it's also a result of this unevenness that something like this can be done at all. I would say, for me, this building is a good example. But from the other side, when you let to do detailed plans or master plans by the developers, you get also quite a lot of horrible examples where you cannot find any idea or architecture. Here is a picture of an advertising agency. That's their office. In the middle, the concrete part, is the column going through the house. And like I said before, it was unexpectedly chosen to the, to the final selection by the Mies van der Rohe Foundation in 2009 which was quite good year by Ms. van der Rohe as uh, the Oslo Opera Theater has won the competition on that year. And this is truly, I would say, the best building in Norway. I have visited it three times and I go back like uh, for a good dinner just to see the building from outside and inside. So that was my second story. Mm -hmm. 
I have told already two stories about my experience or uh, or projects where I have been uh, deeply involved. I want to show a one project what I admire very much and which is not done by me. It's uh, called Tartu University College in Narva. It's the border town exactly on the border of Russia, which is in a way difficult. The most of the population is uh, Russian speaking. It's industrial town. For us, it's like uh, Donetsk in Ukraine. We cannot say that uh, people's salaries are as bad as in Ukraine. Let's say the people who are working in the mines get paid quite well. But despite of it, always you think the city life could be better, as the city has the biggest heritage from the Soviet time. But it hasn't been always like this. You see here the plan of the Narva. It looks like a heart, and it's not today's Narva. It's the Baroque Narva. Narva before Second World War was called the Baroque Pearl of North. It was very beautiful. It was a rich town in uh, 16th and 17th century because Estonia was on the Hanseatic roads and Narva was also a Hanseatic town. One pensioner has made a model of the uh, Baroque Narva, uh, Fyodor Shantsev. I don't know what's his uh, usual profession, profession or what has it been, but he started to do uh, from Carton at home uh, the city center of Narva piece by piece, one house after another. And when he had done it, then it was, um, then it was exhibited in the town hall of uh, Narva. If you see these colorful roofs, you can expect that um, there is admiration that the Baroque Narva should come back, or we should restore it in the way as it was. If you know the story of uh, Warsaw in Poland, then Warsaw was bombed, and uh, in the next decade, there was such a strong will to restore it, that it, that it was done in a way, in a childish way, maybe, but it was like a strong wish to recover the dream. They made all the old town buildings in the same shape as it was built in the mid ages. But you never get the same energy, the same idea and the same material back. So um, in the picture, you see uh, before Second World War building of, uh, of the of the, how it's called, Burr's house, it's, um, it's like uh, ex uh, exchange building. And um, it was standing next to the town hall. Throughout the war, it was destroyed because just two houses from Narva left in untouched way. And uh, throughout the Soviet time, quite a lot of uh, block houses were built to the same city center, where you cannot move people because all the apartments are privatized. Everybody has the right to his own space, his own apartment, and you never cannot take it away, uh, his pri private property, for the idea, let's say, that we will do back the old Baroque Nerva. On the picture here, you see um, installation by a young British artist whose name is uh, Rachel Whitechapel. Hmm? Whitechapel. Thank you. So I forgot it. And um, in the beginning of the 90s, in the eastern part of London, quite many apartment houses were demolished. 
they belong to the city, so for the city it was easy to make a decision. Wooden houses, off with them, we can make new quarters and, uh, and it's fine. And the girl, Rachel Whitereed, uh, made an installation inside of the, one of these houses in the way that he may covered all the walls with concrete. When the house was demolished, then the concrete inside was left. So it was like negative imprint of the room. It was so symbolic and it had such a strong power that uh, Rachel was chosen as a first female artist uh, to the artist of the year in Great Britain. It had never happened before. The story with his inst or her installation didn't last long. It was destroyed some years afterwards because the land was used for the development. But this gave idea in architectural competition to Kava Kava architects, who won the competition with an idea that the new uh, college of the Tartu University should embrace the old existed exchange building in the same way like uh, Rachel Whitereed had done. So the white facade is the negative imprint of the Baroque building which has existed until the Second World War. The roof is also like embracing the old shape of the house and the new college building is behind it. From the competition till the start of the work, it took a decade, but um, just two years ago, the house was completed. In a way, I would say both have won. The modern architecture has won, and the people who stand it for the Baroque uh, in Narva also. And it makes, let's say, quite good combination or uh, a good combination with the old uh, town hall. And what's the value of the building also? It invites the students from uh, different nationalities, Estonians and mainly not Estonian speaking people to the college. It gives new hearts to the city and through architecture, it has given absolutely new value to the town. And here, it's the picture of the <coughs> gates, which are inspired by, by the form of the uh, butterfly wings. So when we talk about transformation, then it has sometimes many meanings. It may be also reappearance of some lost building in a new way. So much about Narva. And my fourth story comes back to Tallinn. The story starts from the start of aviation. You see a picture from 1909. It's the French aviator Blériot. He's just flown over uh, the channel from France to England with his uh, plane called Type 11, which was mostly produced in 1912. And it was uh, very popular and was very much copied by several aviation companies. But not by Russians. Russia had a new, or let's say young, aviation engineer called Igor Sikorsky. And his task was to make the biggest seaplane in the world. He did it. It had a nose like um, um, a bus so that people could stand in the front. It had a long tail. It had a lot of engines and it could carry one ton of bombs. It was very inspiring for the Tsar Nikolai II. 
And in the year 1912, he decided that aviation is the new future. It's something so innovative that it, it has a huge help for the military power. The plane itself was called, according to the famous hero of Russia, Ilya Muromets. As innovative as was the airplane, so should have been also the hangars for the airplanes. And Tsar made a competition, international, how to create the hangars. Here is a picture from 1912, where he starts the competition and came to visit Tallinn to see the site. The competition was successful in a way that they had a lot of uh, works and the winning company was Danish company Christiani and Nielsen because they said we will do the hangars from new material let's say it's old material we will do it out of concrete but we will do it out of uh, steel reinforced concrete and the roof of the hangar will be extremely small it's going to be just five centimeters thick. Tsar saw innovation in that, approved the drawings, and the building started. The building of the hangars was done according to the size of this uh, biggest plane, Ilya Muromets. It had huge wingspan, the same wingspan as today's uh, plane Boeing 737 has. So it was really very big. The construction of the hangars was followed by English magazine, The Builder. That's also, let's say, for us, the source that we know how it was done, in which phases, because they made like a reportage in many numbers of the magazine. They followed it very carefully. And as it was innovative, it was also interesting. Let's go back to the engineers. You see on the picture, on the lower side, the man with the glasses. It's of Europe. But he worked as a young man in Christianian Nielsen. So he was getting also his education and his knowledge from there. He's maybe the most known engineer of the 20th century because we know him that uh, he helped the young Danish architect Jörn Otzen to make the project of the Sydney Opera Theatre. So the constructive history of uh, steel reinforced shells can be followed throughout the century from the hangars on. Here is a picture how it was built. So that it was filled with a full wooden scaffolding uh, the shells were built in three, let's say, phases, so that uh, they made five or six meters each time and went to the top. The seaplane harbor is situated uh, at the seaside in Tallinn, so that um, it's close to the old sea fort, which was user, used later as a jail. The seaplane harbor was consisted from the hangars and also from the aquatorium in front of it because you need a lot of water space uh, for the planes where they can land. So, and when you see these two things, the sea fort, the seaplane and harbor, then it's quite a big part of the protection of the Tallinn in the beginning of the 20th century. Absolutely, there were different cannons which were able to shoot very far to the sea also cannons on the islands, but it was thought to be a very important uh, fortress or part of the pr protection. Some pictures from the 1920s. Uh, Finnish aviation forces are visiting the hangars. You can see that how many small planes can fit into the hangar. 
the Estonians have also bought uh, some planes from uh, Great Britain. Uh, this is marvelous plane. It's uh, called Short 184. And it's important because it was uh, built in 1916. And uh, it was the first plane where you could drop a torpedo and it, it hit the target. But it happened just once. The English had, uh, had got uh, with the torpedo one Turkish ship in a harbor. And after that, it was a selling point of the planes. Estonians bought eight of these beautiful planes. But by buying this and flying with them, they understood that uh, dropping torpedoes from the plane is not the most useful thing what to do with the plane. The hangars were visited by also many, let's say, aviators, and, uh, and it was a known place within Europe and also in America. Here you see uh, Charles Lindbergh. He's, uh, he's the aviator who made the first solo flight from New York to, to Europe in 1927. He came also to see the seaplane hangars. We have some cars around it. So it was, let's say, quite beautiful. Everything was good. The hangars stand it. The project was successful. The thickness of the concrete was just uh, five centimeters. And nobody thought about uh, how useful would it be in real war. Because five centimeters is such a thin layer of concrete that when you would bomb it, it would not make any sense. Soviet era had an influence. The planes from the seaplane harbor were sent uh, uh, to the to Soviet Union, to different places. The pilots also to teach uh, pilots for the Soviet military. And the seaplane harbor was used as a storage for anti-submarine nets. The building itself. Anti-submarine net is a net where every ring of the net is so big. And the net itself was so big that it could close all the site to Tallinn. It's two kilometers long. And at least there are uh, stories that it was, the Tallinn was closed from the sea during the Moscow Olympic Games, where, when the sail yachting part of the Olympic Games was held in Tallinn. And Soviet Union was afraid that some other countries would intervene somehow with submarines or uh, fake the results of the yachting arena. Whatever. That's the picture of the uh, 1990s. Sunken wreckage is in the aquatorium and the building in cell itself in horrible condition. Horrible in that sense that it was very close to collapse. Estonia got free 1991, but we didn't get back these hangers because in democratic uh, society, you go to the court when somebody says, it belongs to me. Estonia went to court against the uh, old Soviet military officers who said, we have bought the land and the hangers. And the court case lasted 12 years. During this time, the hangers went every winter into worse shape in the sense that when concrete is not protected from winter and you have 50 or 60 cold cycles per year, the cracks inside the concrete get larger and longer exponentially. That's the view of the hangers. You can see in some places throughout the concrete you can see also from the engineering part of uh, view or point of view that um, all the steel which should stay inside of the concrete or be at least in the middle of concrete is visible. And um, when you see that the concrete, protecting concrete over the steel is gone and the steel itself is rusty, then uh, maybe it's even not uh, doable, or let's say 
what would be the idea, what would be the idea how to do it? And so told uh, the Finnish professors from the Helsinki University, who had uh, just before this, uh, the start of the, let's say, the progress of Seaplane Harbor, they had just finished uh, consulting the Helsinki Olympic Arena, which is a construct, uh, concrete construction from 1930s, beginning of 1930s, much younger than this building. And by looking to these hangars, they said, forget guys, uh, think about the memorial, make a competition, how to present it or how to make a beautiful poster that, uh, that was the place where the hangar was and uh, keep the ruins. because you cannot heal it, because when you touch it, it will fall. But despite the situation, uh, the state was ready to uh, invest some um, finances into the analysis and the first uh, recovery studies. You see, the, the walls are moldy and the bricks are, uh, let's say, there are some bricks. And um, they invested into some uh, recovery studies with hope that um, if it would be doable, it could be a maritime museum. It sounded like a dream which, which, which cannot be realized. We participated on the competition um, to make a maritime museum into the hangars, which will probably not held more than one or two years. But it's not unusual. You can have competitions on um, everything. Is it realistic or non-realistic? And we proposed on the competition idea that uh, the hangars could keep their own, let's say, shape as one uh, room without any intervening uh, walls or change of the shape from the outer side. And we would do the exhibition into the museum in layers, not sectioning it into the rooms, but doing it in layers, so that the border or the main layer would be the water level of the main exponent, which has been the submarine, Estonian submarine from 1936. And so the exhibition was planned that um, on the water level of the submarine is a walking bridge for the visitors, you can look uh, from there to the ships which hang from the roof. It sounded crazy on that time. Which hang from the roof on the same level as the bridge so that you have the feeling that if you have imaginary water level, then the ships and boats and yachts are in the water. And so we dreamed on that uh, we could place a replica of this uh, beautiful short 184 to the roof or close to the roof, which would be higher than the water level. And all the other military stuff, like torpedoes and mines, to the ground, next to the wreckages, like in the seabed. Constructively, we thought that with black, you can see the original um, constructions, that by doing any intervention to the house, we don't touch any of the original um, constructions still in the dream phase. We thought that um, if it's possible to rescue the building, then the concrete will be itself so valuable that uh, we are not the right persons uh, to touch it with our constructions or to hide them or to use them for new constructions. It should be absolutely separate because something is an uh, engineering masterpiece from the 20th century and something else is that uh, we change the function of the building. So we made new constructions onto the side wall uh, for the cannons but kept distance from the old construction one meter and also by doing them cafeteria area, we kept distance from the old uh, main constructions. And that's the way of the visitors. 
visitors enter the house on the ground level, they buy a ticket, they go up by stairs or by lift, they reach the second or the first floor, and they walk along the bridge on the water level to the end. Here is meant to be, was meant to be a um, special bridge, very high, which shows the shape of the roof. You can climb close to the uh, plane and go along the bridge uh, until this point. From here you have access to the cannon terrace. You can come out from here also. You can go into the submarine and here from the stairs to the ground. On the ground, uh, torpedoes and mines and under the cannon terrace, different uh, interactive uh, models and uh, interactive um, stations for flying and uh, and sailing and uh, navigation on the sea and um, shooting a cannon. That's the 3D picture. The bridge line in the middle. And we made also a drawing uh, for the seabed, which was inspired by um, inspired by the sea map of the Baltic Sea, so that there are like higher places and deeper places. Uh, the yellow line, which usually on the sea maps shows the uh, ferry way, was meant uh, to be uh, the way for the visitors, so that the, every visitor is like a ferry on the sea and goes from one, one exhibition point to other. And from for the children, we just uh, made a lot of uh, a lot of um, different uh, places into the sea which show uh, the names of islands and uh, wreckages and so on. By doing the project, nobody stopped so that um, there was a competition for the building. And we had done a project for the restoration. Still not sure if it's possible. By doing the project for the restoration. Uh, I had involved an um, old professor from the Tallinn Technical University. His name is Karl Uyger. He was 86 years old in the beginning of the process. And he said, uh, as long as I live, I can deal with it. Does it collapse? Does it not? I can deal with it, as long as it stands. And he has been expert and teacher in the university more, more than 50 years. And he was the wise man who made uh, also the recipe for the reconstruction. And it was important to keep on it. For the recipe, first, we marked up all the cracks in the concrete. And you cannot believe the map of the cracks is like this. Every crack was marked. Every crack was diagnosed according to the type, because you can have the cracks which are just on the surface. You can have cracks which go through the concrete and are dangerous. You can have cracks on the upper surface or lower surface. They were marked with a spray, and every crack got a number. You see, number 157. And here is a map of the cracks. The first healing process was cleaning the surface and, um, and the cracks were nailed. You cannot see it very well, but um, on the upper picture you can see it. Um, the roof looked like a hedgehog, so that uh, it was filled with metallic nails which went diagonally through the crack and stitched it. In a way, it's similar like uh, in the normal uh, human medicine. You stitch uh, the wounds. And all the cracks were filled with epoxy. Uh, and so also the nails, so that the epoxy would go so deep into the crack and into the concrete as possible under pressure. The second job was to clean and uh, to repair uh, the steel, the steel armatures inside of the building. As we didn't have any drawings 
of the original construction. We thought they are burned in the war. Then uh, we had to discover it by, uh, by the constructions. And uh, the construction of the house was not uh, even. So when you thought in one corner that the another corner is similar, then it wasn't because Christiania Nielsen was also experimenting and they changed the technology throughout uh, the building. And so the steels were cleaned with high pressure water, 2,600 bars. You can imagine it's a, it's a water pressure which, uh, which is 2,000 times more than the pressure in your uh, car wheel wheels. With uh, that pressure of water, you just cut the concrete, but you keep the metal. And um, by doing this job, the man doing it is uh, dressed like an astronaut. So he has a very thick costume and you have no-go zone 20 meters around him because the pieces of concrete are uh, flying like bullets. And when the concrete, or let's say the metal was cleaned, then every piece of the metal or armature was hand painted because there is even today no other technology to be sure that, um, that you protect the metal against the further rusting. By doing it, first of all, all the hangar was filled again with uh, scaffolding so that um, we had 7,000 square meters of space filled with scaffolding. Quite a good scene for the movie makers, but we didn't have any. It was too dangerous. And the healing of the house was done by uh, square meters. So that um, the roof itself was divided into the square meters, like, uh, like we have the squares in the chess play. And uh, the cleaning and placing a new concrete below was done so that when you did one corner, you had to go to the opposite corner. Because we were so afraid that any vibration will bring the collapse of the shells, that even as it took a huge amount of time and uh, men hour, uh, we kept to this recipe uh, to the end. Um, I must say, we succeeded, but not uh, fully. In winter 2010, one morning at seven o'clock, I got the call. Uh, four square meters of the shell had fallen down. What did you do? I went there in the morning, cold. When you breathe, you have this uh, smoke coming out from your mouth. I was uh, standing there together with 86 year old engineer and I asked him, What's your opinion? What's going to be next? Will the shell come down or will it stay? He said, in this condition you cannot predict and told me that he had to make once an expertise to a similar house where a shell of a um, pool house in Moscow had fallen down somewhere in the Soviet Union. And he said it, it was a happy accident because uh, it was in the night and the guard who had to be um, uh, guarding the pool house went out from the room to the toilet. And in the moment when he entered back the house, then the roof fell down and uh, the man was thrown out with the pressure of air. That was, let's say, this story was the only knowledge what's gonna happen next. And when you have such a fragile structure, then it's like uh, dealing with ice. When you go to the sea and you, when you fall through the ice, the rescue of yourself is very difficult because you don't have a surface next to you where you can climb on because every next piece is gonna break. And we knew that the project is over on the same moment when a bigger piece falls down because we don't have any material where to climb on or let's say where to touch and where, where to build on the new concrete. One thing about the concrete also, we added new concrete as part of the recipe. By doing the recipe for the concrete, we went to Switzerland because they have the most of the recipes from concrete, from the tunnel building. 
And uh, they have done it for so long that you can follow up uh, concrete which has done it 50 or 60 years. And so we asked the factory Sika to open up a recipe what they used in 1980s by latest. They had done new recipes, but we said, okay, let's go back to the recipe from 1980s because we know some tunnels are done in 1930s by the same recipe. And we know what's their condition and how they react and what's their chemical processes. Because concrete is not stable material. It carbonizes with time and uh, when you have already the cracks inside and the steel is rusty, then, then the process of uh, demolition in a way inside has uh, started. And the speciality of the Sika concrete was that it's uh, 10 times stronger than normal. So we could add very thin layer of new concrete, which is important because we couldn't change the foundation of the house. So we had to be very careful by adding new loads to the existing house. One more thing, what we did. When you use this uh, sprayed concrete, then uh, the surface itself looks ugly. Because when you do it by square meters, it gives like a bluish border of every time when you have added something and the surface itself is uh, really not beautiful. So we decided that we do something else. We don't leave it as it was by renewal of the concrete. And we got inspiration from the previous state of the hangars. The hangars had stayed for decades in rain, in weather, so that the upper light holes were open, so that the rainwater could have, could come down and wash lines or rivers into the internal spaces of the shells, which were dark from the war time. We thought, it's not maybe most uh, clear or most uh, stable way or sure way to do something because we were afraid that it can look kitschy, but we decided we will try it. We tried to do the same thing with mechanical ways. We painted the shell is black with spray. And as it was done and the paint was still wet, we asked firemen to wash it down in rivers. So we made like uh, 7,000 square meters of the roof surface into patica or aquarelle. By doing this, uh, it was impossible to see the result because when you stand on the scaffolding, you see just uh, some meters below you. You don't know how exactly it uh, will end. And so the guidance to the firemen was, okay, keep it right down, 10 meters larger the river, and then keep uh, five meters of the black, and then again, maybe now seven meters of river. And the result was visible later when the scaffolding was uh, removed. In a way, it gave uh, the dramatic effect for the inside, what we needed for the exhibition. As you already understood, we, uh, we could renovate the concrete. It took uh, three years, many um, unhappy neighbors, because the work was done throughout the day and night in three shifts because as the project was supported by European Union, we had a deadline what we couldn't go over so that it was clear the end will be that the building is restored or it will collapse, but we don't shift the deadline. Next thing, the house itself has been a gold uh, house since it was built, but uh, in Tallinn, where we have um, quite cold winters, would it mean that um, you cannot use the space at least half a year when you leave it as a cold, uh, cold house? We started thinking, how can we insulate it? And we used uh, 
Kapoor film. To get it, uh, to get the insulation in the shape as the shells, so that we wouldn't have any angles. What you use, what you get with uh, plates of insulation. So the poor insulation was placed in ten layers, centimeter every time. You cannot put much of it because it spreads and grows so much that you cannot control the shape of the layer. And here are pictures in between. The work itself is not um, very thankful because you have to take into account that uh, very hot day is not good because uh, the material uh, functions differently. Windy day is not good, but at the sea you have uh, wind all the time. The material will uh, flow away. And gold is also not good because uh, the thickness of material doesn't appear. And as you see, we had uh, also in the, in the building period a um, uh, beautiful winter when the hangars looked like uh, packed by crystal. By doing the aquarelle painting inside, we had to do something with outside also. So we stick to the same idea because we had to insulate the walls also. We insulated it with uh, three centimeters of uh, special plaster, which, is, which has the insulation um, capacity of half of the usual, let's say, 20 centimeter plate insulation. And so by doing uh, the insulation with plaster, we painted it also with the same aquarelle uh, technique by knowing that we are very much on the edge of the kitchen and it can look uh, very bad. But we had the option also that uh, we could have uh, repainted the building. And differently from the previous state for the seaplanes, we placed glasses on two facades into the openings. Some building pictures. One difficulty on the process was also how to bring the submarine into the house. We had some um, shipyards next, next, uh, next door, or let's say half a kilometer away. They proposed different things. There are uh, plates with uh, wheels, what you can rent from England. You can place uh, 20 of them, every wheel is turning, and you can come with, uh, with the submarine throughout the streets or make a street. Then one option was uh, to cut the submarine into three pieces bring it out from the sea and weld into one piece again. There was no option that we can uh, take it out with a crane because uh, uh, the kai or the border from the sea was so soft that we couldn't uh, raise 600 tons without breaking the sea border. What we did, we winched it out. It was quite a funny technique uh, and inventive. To do that, uh, we got a tank from the museum, an old Soviet tank which was uh, used in 1970s or was built for winching the trains back to Drak, which meant we had a good winch. We made an uh, addition to that winch. It could just uh, drag 30 tons, but we needed to drag uh, 150 tons, so we made it slower but it was strong enough. We ordered from uh, China uh, air pillows so that you can move the submarine like uh, the gypsums use, used uh, to move the stones on the wood bulks. So we used uh, air filled pillows and so we winched it into the house in one piece. Next thing, here you see Here is almost completed the montage of the bridges. The idea of the bridges is uh, originating from 19th century, from the railway bridges. But the difference from the railway bridges is that uh, every piece of metal in this bridge has a different shape. So it, it's totally 3D generated, and the factory got the 3D pieces. And first they couldn't montage it because it was too difficult to understand how it will uh, fit in uh, real life. And the second thing, 
there are folding doors. The folding doors in front of the glass facade are working for the purpose of changing the light conditions. Because when you do a museum, then you have to spotlight all the exhibits, otherwise you won't have a focus in the museum. But in the same way, uh, by doing the museum, we wanted also to have the people's attention to the original engineer technical chef That's why we made the folding doors out of metal, which open up every hour once, so that they open slowly, one by one. They bring in the street light and it uh, changes totally the light conditions inside. The very dark room gets enlightened. You will forget about the exhibition and you see the space, you see the construction and you can follow up how it was made and what's, what was the original purpose of it. That's a picture of a technical room, not very interesting. But it's here because it reminds me we had to heat up the house. Complicated issue. Because when you have 100,000 100, cubical meters of air to heat up, then it's not in the power of a national museum to do it uh, by themselves. So it was once a point in the project where we had already the renovation of the concrete moving But the museum said, you know, the concept is not going to work. Uh, we have to rethink. We cannot do all the electronic stuff and interactive things because uh, we're not able to heat up the house. And on that moment, we looked to the Norway. They have uh, the best experience of working sea heating systems, which means that you have a heat pump which gets in uh, seawater, whatever the temperature, takes out a little bit of the temperature and lets the little bit colder water back to the sea. But by doing it so with large amounts of water, you can get quite a big amount of energy. And so we decided to try it. No law was against it, because it hadn't been done before. But it works so, and really it does, that uh, even in the winter when the water temperature in the sea, minus five meters, is plus one degree, or plus 1.5, we can take out one degree, let back into the sea plus 0.5 degrees water, and heat up the hangars to 17 degrees. It was really very important breakthrough because uh, the difference in price in maintenance is around eight times from the central heating versus uh, the maritime or let's say the seawater uh, heating. Here are some pictures how it looked uh, before. You can see um, from upside, the light holes are open. This one has some kind of cover, but not waterproof. The surrounding itself is uh, rubbish. The ambition of the project was also, as it's uh, at the seaside of Tallinn, that uh, by doing a museum to the seaside, it would be a very important uh, project to open up the seafront to bring life back to the sea. We have had with the sea, let's say, quite, quite a wounded relationship because um, Tallinn was a very open city to the sea until the Second World War. But after that, I don't know why I talk so much about Soviet Union. It's not, uh, it's not my uh, special issue. But let's say, to explain to you the situation or where the reasons come, I have to go back to that. So. In Soviet Union, as it was the western border uh, of Soviet air, area or territory, 
than 200 meters from sea was closed to the public. And even so much that all the buildings which were built 200 meters away from the sea might not have had light windows towards the sea. Because if you have a window towards the sea, then you can signal with light to a spy who is waiting for you with a boat on the sea. So it was a very paranoid uh, situation. And to recover from this situation from 1990s to today uh, is difficult. Because you have uh, most valuable uh, land at the seaside. Everybody understands that uh, the life should be at the seaside. The master planning is uh, at the same time slow because everybody understands the value. Also, um, the owners of the land want to speculate with the land. They want to have uh, higher building rights. And so it's, it has been uh, quite slow progress. And here, by Seaplane Harbour, the area itself is cut away one kilometer from surrounding city center life, so that it's really in the middle of nowhere. But here you see the picture after. It's made in 2011. We used also the graphics uh, on the landscape so that the helicopters can land here or it would be visible um, as the as the start of concentric rings from the Google map. Other view, before, it's the picture from uh, 2010, April, just uh, the start of the renovation works. And May 2012, when the museum was opened, and at the moment you can see that the folding do doors are open. The folding doors have one more function, what I forgot to tell you about. And it's, uh, it's the function of invitation. The idea is that when in the evening the museum is closed, the doors will open and the exposition inside is lighted. The light will search or play on different exponents so that it's uh, in itself like a play or game that when you walk by, you can discover for you something. So that it was the idea to bring families to spend time at the seaside, to come to the aquatorium, to see the boats, to see the museum. So inside, here you see also what I told, where we got the inspiration for our um, roof. The contrast of the, of the colors. And that's the that's the view from May 2012. You can see there is a, a blue epoxy floor. We, we experimented also with the floor, because when you do such kind of colorful floor, and you expect a lot of visitors, one good material is epoxy for that. But to do a sea ground, it's... Uh, let's say, a little bit uh, difficult. We used different colors, we marked them, we played with the um, um, density of the paint uh, to get uh, the effect uh, wanted. So in a way, it was also like uh, other painting next to the roof. South facade, April 2010 and 2012. On the facade, you can see that the restaurant has south facade um, uh, terrace. Under behind the glass is, is a museum shop, entrance in the middle. And um, when the building was done, then also European Nostra, which, uh, which is basically the collection of the heritage organizations in Europe, has decided that uh, the renovation was uh, worth of Grand Prix of uh, 2013 as the most complex uh, concrete renovation ever done. How does it work? The square and plaza is uh, used for events throughout the summer, almost every evening. 
One thing what we didn't um, take into account is that uh, there are so many events what can be done in the museum that we were not uh, ready for the reaction of the public so that uh, every evening was a catering for 500 or 1000 people because all the companies from Tallinn, from Finland, from Latvia, Sweden wanted to have their event there. But we had enough uh, space for that. On this picture you can see also that um, uh, the bridge, upper bridge, which reminds the angle or inclination of the original shell and is very steep to climb, has been done. And uh, in reality it holds the undergoing bridge in there so that it's supported by sails and the upper bridge is the constructive one. And um, this one is just hanging. The bridge looks like um, some sea creature or snake going through the house so that every vault of the bridge is different. So the shape is moving and uh, going up and down in different rhythm throughout the house. So that it's a play with, um, with material and technology from 19th century, so that all the metal was connected with uh, bolts in a way how it was used in uh, railway bridges, but the technology to do it in um, 3D details is completely contemporary. The cannons, the people in the restaurant and in the submarine, And here is the picture of the reaction, so that um, the house has been full, full since the opening. It's the place uh, of the scenery for the musicals, for the dances. It's uh, loved and hated in, uh, at the one in the same time, because the acoustics in the hangar is for the musicians difficult. The acoustics uh, are the same like it was before. We had once the choice to think about acoustical plaster on the roof, and then we decided, okay, we will not do it. We will keep it as it was, so that uh, when the planes were started in the hangar, the noise was enormous. Uh, the echo in the room is uh, six, seven seconds, so that uh, it reflects on the walls, and we thought, when it's so special, we keep it. For the musicians, it's good when uh, somebody just sings or plays just one instrument, but, but when you do a concert with a um, sound system, then it's horrible because everything reflects. Concerts, fashion shows, outside life, and the people uh, are lined up. It's. Uh, for you, it's the everyday life, let's say, behind Louvre and uh, every museum, you have to wait. Maybe some, sometimes the ticket offices are slow and you don't understand why do you wait. And sometimes you see the crowds are just huge. But it's not uh, normal and usual in, uh, in Tallinn. Because the usual visitor number for a museum is 50,000 per year. The best museum has been the art museum with 100,000 visitors per year. But here, we had opened such an attraction that uh, during two and a half years, as it, uh, from the beginning of the opening, we had over a million visitors. So that it's enormous. We have almost same number of visitors as we have Estonians by nation in uh, our country. Next to the museum, there is also a place for uh, other activities like uh, seaplanes are back. I have to admit that um, by doing that kind of projects, I live into the topic so much that uh, when we started the project of renovation, and by not knowing if it's possible or not, 
I went to the school of uh, private pilots. Do you understand the topic? Do you understand uh, the reason why the building was built? How the people lived there or how it was uh, functioning? By the way, no Ilya Muromets type of these huge planes ever landed in Tallinn because because uh, the building was in 1916, and just a year later, there was a revolution in Russia. But over the winter, 1916-17, there was no calm weather between St. Petersburg and Tallinn. And the Ilya Muromets could fly just uh, in calm conditions. In that way, it belonged to the plain category of butterflies. So that was my story about uh, Seaplane Harbor. And I believe I have told you four different stories. And now it's time for questions. Thank you very much.